Okay, welcome everybody uh, once again to the Texas Politics Speaker Series. Uh, we are very happy to have Representative Mark Vesey here with us today. Uh, Representative Vesey was elected to, rep to represent House District 95 in November of 2004. He serves on the Environmental uh, Regulation Committee, the Redistricting Committee, and the Pensions, Investments, and Financial Services Committee in the Texas House of Representatives. And in early 2009, his colleagues elected him chair pro tem of the House Democratic Caucus. Uh, he is focused on a range of issues, including health care and public education issues, and is widely regarded as one of the most promising young members uh, of the Texas legislature. So please welcome Representative Mark Vesey to the University of Texas at Austin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and I uh, took my jacket off. It's getting that time of the year. Thanksgiving's coming up. Christmas is coming up. So I've packed away a few pounds, and it was kind of tight. And so <laughs> I decided to shed it. Um, but it's good to be here. Good to be at the University of Texas. This is my first time speaking at UT, uh, and I am uh, happy to be here. Uh, don't tell the other universities, but I graduated from Texas Wesleyan University. Uh, we do not have a football team there. It's a, a small Methodist college. If any of you are from Tarrant County, you know that. And so I feel I always consider myself sort of an honorary Longhorn and always root for UT. So I, I definitely want to uh, make that clear. But don't tell anybody from Tech or <laughs> A&M or anybody that. But, um, but good to be here to talk a little bit about politics. And what I thought I would do is tell you a little bit about myself, what my background is, and of course, you can ask me any questions that you would like to. Uh, if you want to uh, discuss uh, campus carry, I know that was a, a, a very big uh, legislative issue and uh, saw a lot of the UT students actually come in and march on the rotunda. Uh, you can ask me about that. If you want to talk about tuition deregulation, feel free to ask me questions about that. But I thought that with 2011, which will be the next time we meet, uh, for the next legislative session, that that will be a redistricting year. And so I thought that, uh, that I would sort of focus on that. And if you wanted to ask me questions about redistricting, uh, I would allow you to do so because really, I mean, once the session gets going, and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be short of money when we get back. Um, you know, there's some talk about casino gambling, finally making it onto the House floor, and us having a discussion about that. Uh, but I can tell you that, regardless of how controversial any of those items are, that nothing will be as exciting, nothing will be as fiercely debated as how lines are redrawn for all levels of government, whether that's congressional redistricting, whether it's uh, state senate, state house, uh, judicial d districts, redistricting uh, is going to be key. Um, and before I go into that, I uh, want to let you know I'm from Fort Worth, a lifelong resident of Fort Worth, born and reared in Fort Worth, um, and I uh, worked for a U.S. congressman uh, for several years before I ran for the House. I worked for Martin Frost, uh, who was a member of Congress uh, from uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, Martin, kind of like me, went to high school in, uh, uh, in Fort Worth and then ended up uh, running for the House and was in leadership in the Democratic House. Uh, actually, in 2000, and I want to say that was in 2002, uh, when Dick Gephardt, who was the minority leader, Democrats were in the minority at the time, uh, Dick Gephardt um, decided that he was no longer going to serve in the House of Representatives. He had been the minority leader. He had run for president of the United States, and uh, the guy that I was working for ran against Nancy Pelosi, who is now the Speaker of the House. They ran against each other for minority leader, and so for me, being a young uh, staff person and having the opportunity to be a part of that and to you know, go online and read roll call uh, and you know, see this, you know, these articles about your boss running against Nancy Pelosi and who's going to be the next Democratic speaker, because it was always assumed whoever won that leadership race was going to be the next speaker of the House whenever the Democrats took over. And indeed, when Democrats did take over in 2006, Nancy Pelosi became the first uh, female speaker of the U.S. House. But you know, being a part of that certainly influenced me. Uh, I mean, just the people that I got to meet working for the congressman, uh, the opportunity that I uh, had to learn about legislation and to learn about how politics worked uh, definitely influenced me greatly. 
And so when the opportunity came up for me to run for the House, I decided that, uh, that I would do so. Uh, and usually when you run for office the first time, you lose. And I actually won the first time that I ran uh, and, um, and, and ended up coming to Austin. Uh, uh, when I first came, uh, things were, were a lot different than they are now. The speaker that we had my first two sessions, you know, he was a lot different than the current speaker. Uh, and, and, and I can tell you that, um, you know, I'll, I'll liken, speaking of, you know, me rooting for UT, I mean, it was, I liken it to a football game. Like when I got out of my bed in my apartment in Austin, and I like, you know, put my socks on and, you know, put my pants on, and my, I really felt like I was going to suit up to fight someone every day. Because that's, that's, just, that's just how he was, that was his style. And he liked it, he got up for it, uh, you know, after a while, you know, I kind of, you know, liked it. I mean, there were even a couple of times that some of us were like, hey, I kind of miss, you know, that boxing that we used to do the first two sessions. Um, but, uh, but, but things are definitely uh, more smooth now. But, you know, redistricting could change all of that. Um, with redistricting, particularly this time around, uh, not only will it be a battle of Democrat versus Republican, but uh, many of you probably already know that rural Texas is losing uh, lots of population. And so how many people uh, in rural Texas uh, are going to lose representation in Congress and in our state legislature is going to be a huge issue. Uh, if you live in West Texas or if you're from West Texas or East Texas, I mean, you probably already know or if you have family from those areas that people are moving to the metropolitan areas. People are moving to Fort Worth. People are moving to Dallas. People are moving to Houston, Austin, San Antonio. You know, nobody is, is you know, talking about, I don't think anybody in this room is talking about, um, you know, packing up everything when you finish at UT and moving to, you know, Monahans. I don't think that anybody in here is talking about packing up, you know, everything when they graduate from UT and move into Longview. You know, y'all are trying to move to the major metropolitan areas uh, and, and that's who is going to pick up clout uh, when more clout, uh, when the next redistricting round uh, takes place. Um, in Fort Worth, where I'm from, at the beginning of the decade, we were the 19th largest city in the country. And so now we're already, I believe, the 17th, about to be the 16th largest city in the country. Literally, in just a 10-year period, we've grown that much. Fort Worth is the fastest growing large city uh, in, the, uh, in, in the entire country. And because of that, that also makes us one of the fastest growing large cities in the state. Um, and we, you know, there's a good opportunity that we may pick up a new state legislative seat. And it's going to have to come from somewhere. We're not going to add seats. There's always going to be 150 seats. And so it's just a matter of where, you know, those, where that seat's going to come from. There's a good opportunity that that seat's going to come from rural Texas. Um, where new seats are drawn that you didn't have before. Of course, uh, when U.S. boundaries are drawn, um, you know, those numbers stay the same, except they're awarded to states based on population. And uh, I can tell you that when I was in, at NCSL um, back in, oh, that must have been back in August in Philadelphia, uh, the U.S. Census Bureau came and put on a presentation uh, during uh, one, of the, uh, pres one of the topics at NCSL. And the topic of where people are living uh, came up uh, because in states, that may lose population and they may lose a congressional seat. They're concerned about that. I mean, we spent about 30 minutes uh, during that particular U.S. Census Bureau presentation on where Mormon missionaries are going to be counted. And the U.S. Census Bureau told the lady that was, uh, you know, that was there from Utah, the state legislator that was there from Utah, that uh, if you're a missionary, that you're going to be counted where you're working at at the time. And you know, she got up and she was like, well, that's not fair because you know, we're, we're kind of sitting on the bubble and we may lose one of our seats to Texas. And she goes, that's, that's not fair that, that, you don't, that you're, not, that you're gonna count our missionaries if they're doing work in, in Washington State that you're gonna count them there. And she's just like, that's, just, that's, that's how we do things. Uh, the, the topic of prisoners. You know, in, in the state of Texas, a lot of our prisoners are out in East Texas and out in West Texas. If it, weren't for, if it weren't for those prisons, they would probably even lose more representation in Congress and in the State House. Because guess what? Those prisoners, and a lot of prisoners come 
from, unfortunately, come from districts like mine. From, and a lot of them, a lot of the zip codes in my district are overly represented uh, in our state prison system. And I can tell you that those prisoners, they're not going to be counted in my district, even though when they get out of prison, they're going to move back into my district. They're going to be counted in West Texas in Delwyn Jones or, or Joe Heflin or Warren Chisholm's district. And, and that's where those folks are, are going to be counted. That's just, that's just the reality of it. Um, but after all the, all the lines are drawn and the census comes out and we get the numbers, there's a good opportunity that Texas will probably pick up three to four additional U.S. congressional seats. Uh, and that's significant for several reasons. Uh, that will obviously move us up in, in uh, presidential electoral votes. So instead of having 32, you know, we'll probably have 35 or 36 electoral votes when the next presidential election comes around. And there's a lot of strategy involved in that uh, because if you're, Barack, if you're Barack Obama and you're getting ready to run for re-election in 2012, you believe me, his people are already counting where those new congressional seats are going. And with Texas being a red state, he knows that that's three electoral votes that he probably won't get because those electoral votes are probably, with the exception of Utah and Louisiana, because Louisiana lost a lot of folks after Hurricane Katrina, with the exception of Utah and Louisiana, you know, most of the electoral votes that are going to be gained in southern states are going to be lost or going to come from blue states, with the exception of those two states. So believe me, Barack Obama and David Axelrod and those people that you see on MSNBC, they already know that. And, and they're already, you know, trying to figure this thing out and try to come up with the most accurate count possible uh, just because, you know, it, it, can, it can change a, a presidential election. Uh, but it also changes how much dollars comes uh, uh, to, you, to, your, to your state and to your, rep and to your particular communities. In 2006, when the Democrats took over the, the U.S. House, for the first time in 12 years, the city of Fort Worth found itself uh, without a member of Congress on the majority side of the aisle. And before, you know, we had Kay Granger and, you know, Joe Barden represents part of Tarrant County. And so when they were in the majority, you know, it was easy for us to get things for Lockheed and Bell Helicopter and the other industries that we have there. Uh, but now Fort Worth kind of finds itself as the largest city in the, in the country, not only the largest city in the state, but the largest city in the entire country without a member of the majority party. And so there was a huge pool of money for flood control districts that uh, we had applied for that we ended up not getting because we couldn't get it reauthorized. We were the only district in the entire country that didn't get that, those millions and millions of dollars reauthorized, and it was because we didn't have a, a member on the majority side of the aisle. And so you can imagine that when we get ready to do redistricting, that communities, are, they're going to come out and testify. We'll have a hearing here in Austin. We'll have hearings in the Metroplex and Houston area, San Antonio. We'll have a lot of hearings in rural areas. And people are going to come out and say, you know what, if we lose our congressperson, or if, all, or if you draw if you put too much of our rural district into this urban part of Houston or into this urban part of the Metroplex, then we're not going to be electing this congressperson anymore, or we're not going to be electing this state senator anymore, and we're not going to have as much clout as we had in Austin or in, uh, at the Capitol in D.C. anymore. And people are going to come, and they're going to, uh, to express themselves. And, you know, and, and you know, it's funny during the redistricting hearings, I mean, people really get passionate uh, about the topic, as, as they should, because it can literally be the difference between millions of dollars uh, coming to your district uh, or not. I know uh, that in Fort Worth, for instance, the Joint Strike Fighter, uh, that that project employs over 10,000 people at the Lockheed Martin plant. We want to make sure that we have strong representation always in Tarrant County, because whether you're Democrat or Republican, you know, 10,000 people you know somebody that works at that plant. My mom's husband has been at Lockheed for 34 years. And so people's livelihoods are literally tied to who their congressperson is, uh, as well as you know, state dollars that come out of, out, out of the Capitol that as relates to who your state legislators and your uh, state senators are. Um, uh, you know, we, we, lost a, we actually did lose a project 
earlier in the year. Uh, it wasn't the Joint Strike Fighter, but it was another plane that Lockheed had been working on a while. And you know they ended up having to lay off, I believe it was a little over a thousand people. And it makes a, a big, uh, a, a huge difference. And you know, depending on where you live, you probably al already know about these stories and, and have heard about projects in your own area. If you live in the Houston area, then you know how important it is that NASA gets money. Uh, you know, if you live uh, in, a, in West Texas, uh, then you know that, uh, and Tanya Gripton, who works in my office, uh, she's from Abilene. And, you know, I can remember when I was a congressional aide, and uh, they were saying that uh, Dias Air Force Base, which I believe is the Air Force Base in Abilene, that they didn't have enough missions. And so they were actually thinking about shutting that Air Force Base down. And believe me, you want to know that your congressperson is there and that they have clout and that they have power because that will literally affect the economy and everything uh, in an entire town when you start losing your representation and those dollars aren't flowing as much in your community. And so um, I, I think that we'll probably have about 14 or 15 hearings. Uh, but if you get a chance, when they have the one in Austin, you ought to really come out and listen. Uh, because I know that everybody here is from a different part of Texas. Uh, but uh, not only is it really fascinating to, to listen to and to watch different sides jockey over whether or not uh, you know their community should be represented by the person from this party or that party, uh, but just how passionate people also feel just about their communities, regardless of whether they're Democrats or Republican. And so I think, and that's something that really that we can all relate to uh, on, a, on sort of a nonpartisan, um, uh, you know, sort of perspective. Uh, but I, and I and I want to be sh certain. I mean, you know, stop me because I, I want to I, I want to be able to. The, I want the class to be able to ask me questions about anything that went on during the legislative process. And I could talk about redistricting um, the entire time. Um, you know, uh, for Democrats, I can tell you that, you know, we, you want to have a seat at the table when maps are being drawn and lines are being drawn around the state. And, and right now, Democrats, we just actually uh, lost a member. He decided to become a Republican. Uh, and so instead of it being 76, 74, it's virtually, you know, uh, you know seven, we, we we're down to 73 votes now. So it's really like 73, 77. And then uh, a few weeks before that, we found out that another member from a very conservative area in Wichita Falls, uh, David Farabee, that he's not coming back. And so, you know, the odds of us, you know, winning that district back are, are, are probably not going to happen. I mean, he, he was able to continue to win that district because his dad was a state representative in Wichita Falls. He had a very popular name. And so even though the district voted 70 plus percent for George Bush, they were comfortable voting for a Democrat with the last name of Farabee because they really liked his dad a lot. Uh, and they got to know him and they liked him a lot and they thought he represented the community well. But the chances of a Democrat, you know, ever holding that seat again uh, are you know, really remote because rural Texas is definitely becoming more and more conservative uh, and urban and suburban Texas is becoming more and more democratic. And so, you know, we're going to have to really fight hard not, not to just get those particular seats back, uh, but to have a seat at that redistricting table uh, because of uh, what happened. And, and with this sort of a year, and a lot of, a lot of what's going on now is really dictated you know, out of Washington, D.C. I mean, believe me, I, I want a good health care bill. I'm concerned about the deficit. Uh, and I'm concerned about, you know, all, you know, a, a lot of the different points that are being brought up as it relates to national health care. Uh, but, you know, the political strategist in me also knows that the sooner we stop fighting over health care, that for Democrats, that that's going to make things a lot better because that was something that President Obama ran on when he was, you know, presidential nominee Obama. He ran on national health care and the fact that he was going to deliver affordable health care in this bad economy, uh, that he was going to deliver that to the people. Uh, and, and, and I know that that will make a difference all the way in Texas, in state legislative seats and in far places like Monahans and in Fort Worth and in, in, in Austin and in Houston, that whether or not they pass that bill will have a huge effect on what the races turn out like 
uh, in Texas and whether or not Democrats will be able to gain enough clout and whether or not we'll be able to make up those two seats that we have presumably lost uh, and also pick up the additional seats that we need and hold on to our members because we still have members that are in really bad districts. I mean, we have members that um, where Obama literally got like 17, 20 percent of the vote. And we have members that are winning in those districts. Uh, and, and, you know, if things don't come back, then, you know, it could be really bad. And so, you know, I, I want a good health care bill. I'm concerned about costs like everyone else is and what it's going to do to the deficit. But, you know, I like everybody else, I like winning too. And, um, and, and so when I go back to the House of Representatives, I'd like to be on the majority side of the aisle. And I'd like to have a seat at that redistricting table because Democrats won't take over the state Senate. And so what happens with redistricting is that, you know, we draw our lines, the state legislators, we draw our own lines, Senate and House, but we also draw the lines for uh, the U.S. congressional districts. So those 35 or 36 seats that we'll have when the census numbers are delivered in 2011, you know, we'll draw those. I'll, we'll, we'll, and I'm on the redistricting committee, so, you know, I'm going to be drawing uh, Eddie Bernice Johnson up in Dallas. I'll be working on redrawing her seat. I'll be working on redrawing Pete Sessions. Seat. You know, all of us collectively will redraw those 36, 35, 36 congressional seats. But I know that if I'm not in the majority, that that, and I and I don't at least have one seat at the table. That being the state senate, uh, uh, the state house, or the lieutenant governor's office, or the governor's office, who can veto a plan. That, uh, that, you know, it's going to make it really, really tough. Now, one of the things um, that uh, will definitely make redistricting a lot more fair this time around is the fact that President Obama is the president. And so this is the first time since the Voting Rights Act was passed back in the 1960s that a Democrat has been uh, in office at the White House, which means that there will be a Justice Department with, uh, with under a Democratic president. So when we did redistricting last time around, George Bush, George W. Bush was president. When we did redistricting back in the 90s, in the early 90s, uh, 41, uh, George H. W., he was president. And so when they did redistricting back in 81, Ronald Reagan was the president. When they did redistricting back uh, in the 70s, which was the first redistricting done after the Voting Rights Act was passed, Richard Nixon was the president. Uh, and so this is literally the first time that a Justice Department will be, op will be uh, controlled under uh, a Democratic administration uh, since the Voting Rights Act. And that is huge because I don't know if, if any of you remember last time, but what happened during uh, uh, congressional re-redistricting back in uh, 2003 was that the Bush administration, George W. Bush, he said everything was legal. He said that Nope, you know, this, it's okay to, like for instance, my state legislative district is the only part of Fort Worth that is not connected to another part of urban Fort Worth. So, that, so basically there's a, there's, a, there's, there's a big, if you look on the map, on the redistricted map, and you look at the congressional districts, I'm in congressional district 26, there's a big square, and that's Denton County. And then there's a little line coming out of Denton County that comes down I-35, and that little line comes down and takes the constituents out of urban inner city Fort Worth and connects them with constituents in Denton County and runs them all the way up to the, to the Oklahoma border next to Cook County. And that is literally my, my, the congressional district that my state house is in. There are no other communities in Fort Worth in that particular congressional district, no other inner city communities except mine. And so what happens is that my 100 plus thousand constituents can't outvote all of the uh, Republicans in Denton County. There are just a lot more Republicans and a lot more people that live in Denton County that, li that live in my little section of, of inner city Fort Worth. Um, there is a, uh, I know in Dallas that uh, there's a small African American community. Uh, if you live in North Dallas that you've probably heard of, it's over by uh, Texas Instruments. Um, Oh, God, what is the name of that little community? I can't think of it right now. Uh, African-American community, the only one in North Dallas. Uh, and they have that, that particular community 
in a district that goes way out into East Texas, and it's not in any other part of urban Dallas. It's just like they just they have sort of just extracted it out of the urban Dallas district and put it into a far flung, very conservative East Texas district. Uh, someone was telling me that when they did redistricting last time around that they split the communities of Beaumont and Port Arthur, both of those communities heavily African American, and so they and for the state senate district that they put uh, part of Bo they put Beaumont in one state senate district and they put Port Arthur in another state senate district. Well, you know, Bush administration said that was okay. The political appointees at the Justice Department overruled the uh, career attorneys there and they said all of that was okay. I mean, it's, just, it's hard to imagine in a state that's grown so rapidly, in a state that really will pick up four new congressional seats and will pick up population, and, and a lot of that population really is based on on, on heavy African American and Latino growth, and so and, and so I think that that th this Justice Department will pay a, be a lot better attention uh, uh, to that, and, and and I don't mean to be partisan. I just think that that's probably just a, a reality, and so I think that 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 will be sort of the wild card, and and then the entire redistricting uh, uh, redraw this time is is even if the Republicans do control all the different pieces, is you have an Obama administration that I think will be a lot more fair and keep to the spirit of the Voting Rights Act because when they passed the Voting Rights Act in the 60s, I mean, it was really sort of all about making sure that you know, minorities had the right to vote and that their right to vote was protected, but that also uh, you know, different you know, political strategies that were designed to you know, uh, uh, dilute my minority vote and minority participation you know, wouldn't be allowed to take place. And so, because we are a Section 5 state and we are one of those southern states that, uh, that falls under the Voting Rights Act, I hope that the Obama administration uh, is a lot more fair about enforcing those rules. So, I mean, who knows? I mean, I, I say that, but, you know, they have to, they have rules that they have to follow. They have Supreme Court opinions that have been, that, uh, uh, that have been sort of centered around redistricting that they have to follow. And, and so, you know, you just, you, you, have, you have to hope that they do the right thing. I don't think that, um, I, I don't think that the Obama administration is going to be as political with any of those departments, including the Department of Justice, as the Bush administration was. I mean, the Bush administration politicized so many different departments. I mean, they even, I don't know if you remember, but they even had a, uh, um, they, they, you, they, you had to take out uh, parts of, on the Center for Disease Control about uh, condoms not preventing the, uh, the spread of STDs. I mean, they, they politicized every department. Uh, There's stuff about climate change and, and uh, greenhouse gases, and, and they, you know, they, they tried to influence the scientists at the Department of uh, Energy and at the EPA. I mean, there were, the Bush administration really and you probably remember the Alberto Gonzalez and the U.S. attorneys. I mean, they really politicized many of the departments there. Uh, and so I, I really don't think that Obama wants to be criticized the way that Bush was. And so I think that, that they will be fair about it. I, I, can, I can say that. So, and I'd be more than happy because I don't want to just talk forever. And so I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. If you want to ask me questions about redistricting, that's fine. If you want to ask, answer questions, uh, Ask me questions about campus carry or college dereg or any of those issues. You can. Questions? Can you talk a little bit about how the redistricting process actually works? Because you use all sorts of you know high tech kind of you know, GIS technologies for that. I mean, does the, does the, do the Democratic representatives in the redistricting committee have like a, a compute, a GIS specialist that comes and- That's a very good question. And, and that's where redistricting has really, there used to be changes made in redistricting because they used to literally like put big maps on walls and they would like look at railroad tracks and other things like that, that often define what they call communities of interest. But when uh, computer technology and software came out, 
uh, they were really able to draw lines a lot more precisely and figure out like where people were living. And it made it just, it, it made it, it, it made redistricting a, a lot easier to draw, you know, slam dunk type lines. And so, and that's why, like in our state Senate right now, I mean, there aren't that many competitive state Senate seats. That's why I said the Democrats, we will not control the state Senate. There's not a chance we'll control the state Senate uh, because there's, there are no competitive state senates, state, state senate seats in the entire state. There's one, and it's in my district, and it was a very heavily contested race, but it's not on the ballot this time. Uh, Wendy Davis out of Fort Worth. I don't know if any of you are from the Metroplex and you follow that race, but that's, that, that, that district and a, and a district that Chris Harris is in, which is not on the uh, slate this time, those are probably the only two competitive state senate seats literally in the entire state. And so the redistricted map, you know, they've, they figured out how to pack minorities and, and or how to dilute, you know, Democrats in certain areas or how to put enough Republicans in certain districts or how to dilute Republican strength and spread it out so, you know, so you can strengthen districts in one way or the other. Um, and, and it's just, um, it's, it's a lot easier to draw those districts and not make mistakes. Now what they, now what you can attest for, and for instance, in much smaller districts like state legislative districts, um, it's a lot harder to do it that way because, you know, when there are demographic changes in a district that has 160,000 people in it, it's a lot easier for those districts to change over a matter of 10 years than it is for a district with 700 plus thousand people. Like for instance, our state Senate seats have about 715,000 people. There are 31 of those and we have 32 uh, U.S. congressional seats right now and they have about 600 plus thousand people. And so obviously when we get the new census numbers, the state Senate seats will even be that much larger than the U.S. congressional seats, but it's a lot easier to make those safe over a period of 10 years than it is a, a, a state house seat. Because when I first got here, I think there were like 60, 62 members, 66 members, uh, uh, Democratic members. And now, you know, we're, you know, we were two seats away from being in the majority. And uh, you had four seats that were drawn for Republicans to win in Collin County and Williamson County. Now all those seats are held by Democrats. But those seats were drawn with the computer to be Republican seats, but now they're held by Democrats. But it's a lot harder for those sort of population shifts to swing uh, one way or the other, um, you know, in, in, in such large districts like state Senate seats or, or congressional seats. But, the, but, that's, but that's an advantage that the Democrats do have, and that's something that the software can't predict. I mean, the software cannot predict um, if an area is going to change demographically and it's going to have a, and it's going to reflect, you know, politics in the community. Because I, I know like when I, when I first started working in politics back in 98, that the congressman that I worked for, he represented Southwest Dallas County, which has Duncanville, DeSoto, and Cedar Hill. And those areas were considered, I don't know if any of y'all are from Dallas, but those areas were considered like hardcore Republican areas. Now those areas are heavily Democratic. And I mean, those areas went from 10 years ago being places where Democrats like didn't want in their district to be in like heavily African American and, and Democratic areas now. And, and so the computer, the compu that's the one thing that the computers can't do. They can't take into consideration, okay, is this, is this neighborhood going to look this way and, and vote Democrat in five years? The computer can't do that. And so that, that's what ends up making elections be competitive because with the software, it's, it's really amazing what you can do with that software. Okay. Um, could you speak to three issues? One is from the last session having to do with voter ID and why people should care about that. Two has to do with water rights and how that will affect these students as they grow into adulthood and live as good Texans. And three, the, what's coming up in the sunsetting process for the next session? Um, the first one that you asked was about the voter ID. And I'm sorry, go back to it. What was? Why, why they should be prepared about it? What's important about it? Well, you know, the voter ID issue is contentious because basically Democrats have figured out that if a voter ID bill is passed, that it would 
hurt some of our constituents. And Republicans have figured out that in order to stop you know, demographic changes from having effects on elections, that they need to pass the bill in order for them to gain a competitive advantage. And so both sides have figured out that, it, that, that with or without it, it's, it's bad or good for them. And so, and, and that's basically what the big fight is over the voter ID issue right now. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the students should be concerned about it, uh, particularly because with, with y'all commuting and going back and forth from some of y'all maybe registered in, in Austin in your dorm or in your apartment or in your house that you rent here, uh, but some of you may still be registered back at home in the communities that you're from. And so you don't want to give anyone the, the right to deny you to vote. If you are legally registered to vote, you don't want to give anyone a, a tool to question you and, and, and possibly deny you the right to vote if you are, in fact, who you say you are. Uh, and, and, and all you're trying to do is exercise your suffrage. And, and so the voter ID bill that the Republicans are trying to pass, one of the reasons why we fought it so much was really because we thought that they were, uh, that it was more of a, of, of a, they were looking for more of an electoral advantage than trying to protect the sanctity of the ballot box, which I am for. I mean, I, I think that if Republicans and Democrats could sit down and come up with a really fair plan like the Baker, like the uh, Baker, the Carter Baker Commission did. Jimmy, former President Jimmy Carter and former Secretary of State Jim Baker, and and you could like sit down and come up with a real plan, and and try to come up with a plan that would implement a, a photo identification uh, system that was fair, and and one that was not based on putting a burden up on the voters back in order to try to prevent them from voting. Then I really do think that we could work on something. Unfortunately, it's, it's really become more of a political football uh, and, and, one, and you know, one side trying to you know, sort of, in my opinion, game the system so they can have an electoral advantage. And that, and that type of voter ID system, to me, we just can't have. And, and that it, not only it may it, it affect you, but you want to make sure that, that, that if it's going to affect others in the community that you're from, even if it won't affect you directly, I mean, you don't want you know, that sort of thing happening systematically and randomly throughout the state. You know, th those battles have already been fought uh, since, you know, most of us were born. And you don't, we don't want to, you know, have to revisit that. I, I just think that it's, it's bad for the state and bad for voting rights for everyone. So, uh, and then the second question was on Well, you know, we're having a big, we're having a big water conference right now uh, in Fort Worth, and obviously, you know, as areas continue to grow, like I talked about, you know, they're going to need water, and that water has to come from somewhere. And there are areas uh, in our state to where water is plentiful, like in East Texas, an area that's not growing as fast. And and who has the rights of those water rights, and how that water is transferred, you know, is going to continue to. Uh, be to be a major issue. Uh, and we saw the bill, and, and I, I don't think it was this session, it seems like it was a session before last, uh, with uh, Stephen Frost, who's a, a Democrat out in Atlanta, Texas, out in East Texas, uh, that there was a huge fight over the, the whole uh, uh, issue of, uh, of water usage and, and East Texas you know, water being delivered to other parts of the state, including you know, where I'm from in the Metroplex. Uh, and, and I mean, and, and, and all of you that are from larger cities, you know that, uh, you know, as new people move in and new houses are built, that's new plumbing, that's new schools, that's more and more people using water. And, and, and that water has to be supplied from somewhere. Uh, and so what we're going to do uh, as far as uh, in the legislature, I'm not sure exactly what type of bills have been filed. I didn't get to spend too much time. I got to spend just a little bit yesterday at the water conference. So exactly what type of uh, bills are going to, uh, you know, be in place this time around? I'm not sure, but I can tell you that that really from, uh, you know, from now until forever, water rights is going to be a, a, a very contentious and big issue, yeah. particularly as our state, and I think our state's going to continue to grow. The this we live in a state where the cost of living is relatively low, 
you can still get a house in most places at a very reasonable price. People see this as a place of opportunity. When I was in Los Angeles, back during Labor Day visiting relatives, uh, it was amazing how many people from Los Angeles were saying that they want to get to Texas as fast as they can uh, because they know that the opportunity is here. And the third one was sunset. Um, big issues on and I'm trying. I, I can't remember all the, the big the big ones that are up for sunset this time around. I would need to go back and check because I don't want to. I, I don't want to start guessing, but I don't remember. Kathy, you remember which ones are? TCQ, TC. And, and I am on uh, environmental regulation, uh, and I can tell you that. Um, not sure exactly how the whole sunset process is going to play out, but as it relates to those environmental issues, I think a lot of us that sat on that particular committee and we listened to testimony about cement plants in, in Ellis County, and those of you from the Metroplex, you know about the cement plants in Ellis County, about how, uh, about how those cement plants provide jobs for people in Ellis County versus uh, the mercury levels. Uh, and the other toxic chemical levels that those plants emit uh, that uh, have an effect on people's health issues and, and the environment in the Metroplex and in other areas. Um, the Obama administration depended on exactly uh, uh, how the new EPA, and we just got a new EPA administrator, exactly how those rules are going to be enforced, what new federal laws are, are put into effect could have a, a really a, a, a big impact on not only anything that happens in Sunset, but, but you know, through Environmental Regulation Committee, uh, and, and a lot of it may just pass the state completely. I mean, a, a, lot, of, a lot of what is being implemented nationally may make the things that we talk about next session, you know, I mean, it, it may be out of our hands. I mean, it could really be being dictated from the federal uh, level with the cap and trade bill, which, I, which you know, cap and trade, all of my friends in D.C. are telling me that the Senate is so far, is so far away from having the 60 votes needed in order to uh, even bring that up for a vote that, uh, that it may be even unlikely that it, it may even happen. Uh, because one of the things with cap and trade that have really have not been worked out is whether or not, you know, these new restrictions and rules that are placed on companies as, as, as these rules affect their operating expenses and how they run their day-to-day -day business, whether or not people are really going to lose jobs. I mean, no one uh, uh, has, has, has really been able to address that, and so people are scared. I mean, we just talked a little bit ago about how, uh, you know, in, in Fort Worth, as it relates to Lockheed Martin, uh, you know, how, you know, if, if those jets aren't funded, you know, people are going to be out of work. You know, I know that, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, with the oil and gas industry, particular here in this state, as it relates to, you know, environmental issues, uh, people are really watching to see what's going to happen in D.C. Uh, because, like in Fort Worth, for instance, oil and gas, particularly gas with drilling in the Barnett Shale, is like a huge issue. And so you're talking about millions of dollars that were pumped into our economy that, in, particularly in Tarrant County, we never thought we were going to see. And all of a sudden, you know, now we're dependent on that money. And so, you know, how you, you know, work around those issues, how Congress in particular is ever going to come up with uh, a way to deal with those issues really, I think, is going to be uh, very controversial. And so I think a lot of things that we do here on the state level um, will really be dictated a lot. And, that's, and I, I think that that's one advantage that we have by having a legislative uh, a legislature that only meets every other year, is that we're we're going to literally get to sit back for a, a whole another year, 14 months, to watch exactly what sort of rules Obama administration hands down, and, it, and it, it's going to it's, it's going to play greatly into what we do next session as it relates to any sort of environmental issues. I'm going to ask one last question before we let you go, and that is. Um, I, like we have to ask about the other big issue that seems to me to be pending for the next session, even though we're, you know, a year and an election away from the next session. Just how bad is the budget fight going to be next time? Just how I hard think it's going to be, be bad. I mean, from all, from everything that I've heard and and um, and and you know, and just talking with folks that you know that weren't not bringing in as much money as we were, but 
like I talked about earlier, our state is going to continue to grow. We're, we're still going to have schools that, that, uh, you know, that need, you know, teachers and, and things and, and salary, you know, just everything that goes along with running a state. Um, and so how we go about meeting all those new needs, all those new social needs, transportation needs, there's more, more and more people. I mean, our, our roads are so, I mean, we used to, when I was in Fort Worth, we used to always laugh about, uh, and, if, and if any of y'all live in the Metroplex, you'll appreciate this, we used to always laugh about, you know, how if, you're, if you live in Dallas that, you know, you were crazy for wanting to live there just because having to get on 635, you know, just to get on LBJ every day was like such a nightmare. And like, how, why would anybody want to, you know, travel back and forth on, on 635 every day? Well, now we have roads in Fort Worth that are literally that congested. And it is because of, of all the growth that we have. And so TxDOT, which doesn't have a whole bunch of money, you know, they're, you know we, we're going to need to figure out how to pay for all these new projects and how you go about paying them uh, when, you know, we're bringing in less and less money, when people aren't spending as much money and, and more and, and money's not coming in, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I think it's going to be a very uh, tough session as it relates to the budget. And, and you know, and, and the budget may be just as bad as redistricting, but I don't think that anything can be bad as redistricting. Yeah, I just, I really don't. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, thank you, Representative. Thank Deasy. you.